Texas where we are thawing out from the craziest week. We're so excited that you're joining us, hopefully in your warm home. I think most of our city has restored power. I know there's still water that many of us don't have. I got a hot shower today at a friend's house and I was so thankful for that. So um, we're so excited that you're gonna be worshiping with us tonight. We know it's important for us, especially after this crazy week, to come together as the body of Christ and to lean in to Jesus and to worship Him. And so I just encourage you all over this city, all over the state, wherever you may be joining us online live tonight, just want to encourage you just to open up your hearts. The King of Kings is near. You know, I was reading Psalm 23 about our good shepherd and he has nothing, there's nothing that we're lacking with our King. And so just lean into the good shepherd tonight. That comforter wants to draw so near. So we just invite you to open your hearts and we're gonna worship tonight.
pleasure of your presence is what we've always wanted. The movement of your spirit is what we're longing for. We've come to bring you glory in all the adoration, for you deserve our
King of kings and Lord of lords. You're the one that we came here for. We worship you. Oh, we worship you. King of kings and Lord of lords. You're the one that my heart adores. I worship you. I worship you. Oh, King of kings and Lord of lords. You're the one that we came here for. We worship you. Oh, we worship you. King of kings and Lord of lords. You're the one that my heart adores. I worship you. Oh, I worship you. God, I'm waiting. 
out there feel the power of those declarations I loved the way that our worship team tonight brought these songs of declaration about God's faithfulness about having confidence in the promises of God about how God causes all things to work together for good you know in Austin we've had quite a week we've seen a lot of things that were really basic to society fail, but we've seen the faithfulness of God, and we can stand strong on his promises. Amen. Yeah, there's a scripture I want to speak over us tonight. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. And I want to encourage you tonight, if you've been in, particularly in Texas, you may be listening in up from another place, but We've had quite a week with the cold that happened, but I want to encourage you, if you find yourself in a place where you're faint, God gives power to the faint, and God increases strength to those who are weary. So if you find yourself in a weary place, if you find yourself in a place where you are faint, this is just an opportunity to turn your heart in, towards heaven and allow the strength of God to fill you. And I just pray for that strength to go across Bethel Austin. I pray across our city, across all those who've been affected this week by all these different things that have been happening and all these different things that have been failing. We just declare the strength of God and the glory of God over your life and over our city. And I really feel that I feel like there's some of you tonight that this has been a really difficult week because your income, you don't have a salary, but it's based on your hours or the ability to actually do work hourly. I feel like God's going to restore that income. And I feel like he wants to release you from stress and he wants to release you from fear. And I just want to pray that there would, that income would not only be restored, but that God would double that income, that God would bring forth and he would sustain you by his power. And so I just want to encourage you from that place where you might feel faint, in that area you might feel faint, that you would begin to just declare his goodness and his faithfulness over your income because God will be faithful and he will bring you through this and he will restore everything that was taken and bring it back to you in Jesus' name. Amen. We serve a, a God who is faithful to us. And when we feel like we're going to fail, he never fails us. So I just want to encourage you to remember his goodness. And no matter what our current circumstance is, we can rest sure that God is working it for our good and our future. And he has a plan and he has a purpose that's beyond what's currently happening. So stand on his word. Stand on those promises wherever you are tonight. Amen. Amen. I want to thank our worship team. Thank you guys so much. So amazing. And Stacy's going to come and do some announcements for us tonight. Oh man, that was so good. 
What you don't know is these guys, many of them had no power (laughs) this week in their homes. They were freezing. (laughs) Some of them have no water. And they've been for and and a newborn baby. That's right. Oh, my goodness. And they've been here since 4 o'clock preparing this set for us. Man, it was so amazing. And those promises are true. God's faithfulness is so good. So we do have a couple of announcements we want to make you aware of. First of all, we're going to be partnering with Austin Disaster Relief Network. And we're going to be helping our city recover from this tragic event that has happened this past week. We're going to be giving you more details soon um, of all of the ways that we can partner with ADRN um, to volunteer and support our community. And so um, just keep posted on our social media. We're going to be releasing that information specifically how we can help the recovery and the cleanup and really help Austin recover We also have a few other things going on that are coming up. We have some March equip classes. Our registration is open. You can get all of our announcements by texting news to 512-782-4696. And those, these announcements will be texted right to your phone. And so you can register online for our March equip classes. We have Birds, Bees, and Purity, Equipping Parents for the Talk. And so Megan Tate and others will be doing that. And also Fruit of the Holy Spirit, Growing into God's Likeness with Shane Harris. So we would love for you to register for those classes coming up in March. We also have a women's event coming up March 3rd. That's an in-person event. It is over half full. So ladies, you need to register for that. If you'd like to attend, it's going to be March 3rd, 7 p.m., Our very own Janessa Waite is going to be leading that hand lettering class. It's going to be a lot of fun at Hideaway Kitchen. It's $10 a person. Again, go online, register for that. All the details will be texted to you. Um, You can register at BethelATX.com lettering. And then lastly, we'd like to make you aware of some serving opportunities here at Bethel Austin. Our sound team is growing. And if you'd like to serve on our sound team, which they've been doing amazing things tonight here in studio to get us live tonight. um, But you can go online at BethelATX.com serve and you can sign up to serve on our sound team as well as all of our teams that are growing. We'd love for you to check those out online and serve our community. God bless you all. We're praying for you as you're in your homes recovering tonight. We cannot wait to get back together in person. We love you. We miss you. And we are praying that the presence of God would just surround you tonight and that you would feel his warm embrace and his nearness. All right, Shane. Okay, so we're going to... uh be receiving our offering. And I just want to say I'm so thankful to be a part of such a generous community. You guys out there are so generous, and it allows us to reach our city and to do so many different things. And um, you're going to be able to give tonight by uh, texting uh, uh, the number that's on the screen for our tithes and our offering. And so you can do that, and you can, you can give that way. And uh, you can also give online. There's different ways that you can give. So just encourage you to do that. We also um, have our established campaign. And what that is, we have leased, we've done a long-term lease on a building that we're currently remodeling. It's 35,000 square feet. It's really going to be amazing. It's going to allow us to do so many things that we can't do now. As a church, we've met all over the place. We've rented other churches. We've met at camps. We've done hotels for the last few years. But God's really giving us this this home, and we're going to build this out in a beautiful way. It's going to allow us to seat somewhere around 800 people, and it's just going to allow us to do so many more different uh, ministries that have been in uh, leaders' hearts at Bethel Austin, and so we're really excited about that. And on March 6th, we're going to have a Hope for the House uh, opportunity to give in our live service, but you can also give before that if you want, and you can do that by Uh, going to the website on your screen. You'll be able to find more out about that campaign and how you can give. Just encourage you, if God puts it in your heart, um, whether you're a part of Bethel Austin or if you're out there and you want to give um, an offering that's above what you give to your local church, we don't want to take your local church offering. But if you feel to sow into uh, what God's doing in Austin, we would welcome that and we would encourage that and we would say thank you for that. 
And so, Lord, we just thank you for your abundance in our lives. We thank you that you give us seed to sow into the kingdom. And God, we thank you for the building that you're giving Bethel Austin. And we thank you that you will supply all of our need to make that building into what you want it to be, God, so that we can reach our city and have a place that we can invite people in to experience your glory and to experience your presence, to experience the encouragement of prophetic words, to experience your healing power and your salvation. We just declare that over that house, over that place in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm going to welcome up our senior leaders, uh, Joaquin and Renee Evans. Thank you. Oh, hi, guys. We survived this last week. Oh, my goodness. It was a wild one, um, as everyone is mentioning here in Texas. It was, um, it was a very crazy winter storm. Um, so we had a lot of snow, and we weren't prepared for it. Uh, we pretty much have summer for 10 months of the year here in Austin. <laughs> And, you know, a mild maybe fall as our winter. So we were very unprepared. But I just wanted to say personally a huge thank you to our Bethel Austin community. Um, we, you know, when we found out that power was going to be off for an extended period of time, we put out on the Facebook page, our closed community page, we put out a post asking uh, if people had needs or if people could help meet needs. And I tell you what, it was such a joy um, as we just watched our community step. Day and he's like, Mom, stop. <laughs> so I won't put you through it. Oh, and we're back. <laughs> Hi again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know what? It's the joys, right? We are thankful for the small things like power and sound and cameras and things that we may have taken for granted last week. We do not take for granted this week. Um, anyway, as I was saying, the church shouldn't just survive in moments of crisis. They should thrive. And this is the way that the church should be, is thriving and coming to a community's needs in, in the hardest of times and the hardest of trials. And um, I began to think about the church because if you're like me, we we live in an amazing community and we have this Facebook page in our community and it's amazing. Everyone rallies around one another, neighbors being neighborly, like handing out water, like helping people shovel their driveways. We really saw this week our uh, house neighborhood where we live, community coming together to help one another. And I thought to myself, what is the difference? You know, obviously we have the church being surrounded by God and surrounding Jesus. But what is the difference between hanging out with people and doing community with neighbors and doing community with the church? And I, I came across the word, which we all know, and sometimes I think we just throw it out very flippantly, but this word fellowship that we talk about in church. And you don't really hear people say, hey, let's go watch a football game and have fellowship together if they're not believers, right? Or you don't really hear your co-workers who perhaps aren't believers, hey, let's go to get a drink after, after work and fellowship with each other, right? It's a very Christian word, right? Very Christian. And 
I like to be able to use words that um, are relevant to people that can really um, cross translate and aren't too Christianese. And so I began thinking, what's another word for fellowship? And really, when you look in the Bible and the translation, there really is no other word that describes the power of community better than the word fellowship. So we're going to make the old new and we're going to make it a great word that we're going to continue to keep using. And it is relevant now just as much as it was for the early church when it was prevalently used throughout the New Testament. But this word means in the Greek koinonia. Now what that means is sharing, unity, close association, participation, and partnership. And I began thinking, well, that's great, but that also feels like the community Facebook page in my neighborhood. I mean, I don't know, we have a pretty great neighborhood, but so what is the difference, God? Why would people want to find community in church rather than in any other social group that there is? And this is what I found in Strong's Bible Dictionary. It defines fellowship like this. It is a cementing together of God's people, and it is something that is only brought about by the Holy Spirit. So we can have community anywhere, but there is a secret ingredient when you have community in church, and that is the cementing of the Holy Spirit. That's where you can have people coming in and having relationship with one another when they don't always have to agree with one another. That's where you can have the diversity of the church be a strength and not a weakness. It is because the Holy Spirit is a binding agent that binds us together with our brothers and sisters. And see, the way that we have fellowship with one another is actually determined by how we have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And we may not know this, but we come into church week in and week out, and we think we're coming to be fed, right? I mean, it's a good reason to come to church, but we think we're coming to be fed. And I have this feeling that the Holy Spirit is like, that's not really what we're doing here. (laughs) What we're really doing here is binding your spirits together. Because you know what can't be easily shaken? Cement. Cement cannot be easily shaken. So if Holy Spirit is the cementing together of God's people, then that is a group of people that come crises and trials and persecution cannot be easily shaken. You know, the fastest growing church in the world is the Iran church. As of October 2020, Iran is the fastest growing church in the world and it is a persecuted church. You are persecuted by being a believer in that nation. Same with China, same with Russia. All of these countries have the fastest growing churches because there's something about trials and there's something about challenges and there's something about persecution that is actually, this may be controversial, healthy for the church. I know we don't like to think of it because we don't really want to be in trials because, come on, they're not really fun. Persecution is not fun. But persecution and trials is a healthy season for churches to be in. It causes and allows the Lord to purify us and grow us. Without trials, without persecution... We get a little unruly and we may not be quite centered on the thing that we're meant to be centered on. We might not keep the main thing, the main thing. But in the midst of these trials is when God is like, hey, eyes on me. Eyes on me. Let's get rid of the things that don't really matter. And let's put our eyes and our attention back on the one that matters, on the one that cements us together with one another. Amen? You know, I was looking up, and I don't don't want to say that. I I have a fear of saying this in that some people may hear it and be like, oh, you cannot liken the last week or the last year from COVID and the snowstorm to the persecuted church. And I'm not. I get it. The persecuted church, like, has got nothing. Like, they're just... You know, we've got a lot, a lot to be thankful for, even in the midst of our hardships. Um, 
But I was reading, and this is five of the things that is noted by people who work amongst the persecuted church as to why the persecuted church is the fastest growing church in the world. Is they have a view of eternity always before them. Sometimes in our Western world, we can get so caught up in our luxuries. I tell you what, I never knew that having a garbage disposal that worked was a luxury <laughs> until this past week. I didn't know. We get so consumed with the bonuses and the add-ons of our life that we forget the main thing is eternity with Jesus, our Savior, that should be driving our life. Amen? Amen. They have a passion for winning souls. You know, you hear some of the people who are part of the Chinese underground church, and they're like, we just cannot imagine being a Christian and not sharing the good news of our Savior. Like, we can't even fathom how Christians don't do that. And I ask us, when was the last time that we shared our Savior with our friends and our family and our neighbors, and I tell you, in this moment of trial, this is the greatest opportunity to share the gospel because we have Jesus Christ inside of us, and he is the hope of glory, amen, the hope for all nations. They are God-centered and not self-centered, I tell you what, like I said before, I am so proud of our church. And I know it's not just our church, but I'm going to brag on our church because I think it's the best church in the world. Um, <laughs> everyone else has amazing churches too, but ours is awesome. Um, but I just watched in awe as our people banded together and helped one another, putting themselves aside and lifting up the needs of the community instead of their own. They were so centered on helping others instead of just helping themselves. You know, my husband and my children, we were lucky enough after uh, two days without power, our associate pastors, the Tates, took us in. Um, so it was us with our three kids and another family in our community moved in as well who had five kids. And it was just, I mean, our kids loved it. They thought it was a giant slumber party. But <laughs> this whole time I'm thinking, wow, like what sacrificial love that you would open your home to that many people because you saw a need and you could meet it. And I thought, wow, that is what being kingdom-centered is, not self-centered. And that is why the persecuted church and churches in trial thrive. The persecuted church has a devotion to the word of God. And, it, and it, it, you know, in the midst of all of these trials that we face in this past year and this, this past week even, like it has to be the word of God in which we build our faith on. It's the unfallible word of, word of God. I'm so surprised as to how many people don't think that this is God. Like this is the words, the living word of God. It's not just fun stories. It's not just like proverbs that we can base our life around because, you know, a lot of Eastern religions have proverbs that they base their life around. But this is living and it is breathing. And when we come against challenges and when we come against trials, we get to see how deep this really goes. Have we been feeding on this or have we been feeding on something else? And the persecuted church has an unwavering hunger for the word of God. You know, I heard about the Chinese church and um, we, were, we were talking to a missionary friend who went there and he would distribute Bibles. And, you know, what they would do is because there was, wasn't enough Bibles to go around, they would rip out some of the pages of the Bibles and they would pass it around from family to family until that piece of paper was so worn out. And it's because they needed that word of God. It was sustenance. It was food to their faith. It is what they stood on when everything around them was shaking. They stood on the word of God. We need to have the word of God in us and coming out of us. Amen. And the other thing about the persecuted church is their readiness to serve. 
And we have just seen this demonstrated so beautifully in so many churches all across this nation, but even internationally, have been contacting us saying, or contacting the city of Austin and Texas and the surrounding region saying, how can we help? How can we serve? What can we do? And that is the beauty of the church. Amen. That is family. That is family. We serve one another. We serve one another. And in by doing so, we serve God. I just imagine... I just imagine the smile on God's face as he watches the church rise up to her potential. As he watches the church open their homes to the hurting and the needy. As he watches the church give of their finances, of their resources, of their time, delivering crates of water to people who need water. I love that God uses us the local church to serve the world. Because he could do it without us. He really could. I mean, if he can cause like manna to fall from heaven, then surely he could cause crates of water to arrive on people's doorsteps. (laughs) I mean, he really could do it without us, but he doesn't want to. It is our privilege that we get to partner with God and serve him and serve our city and serve the people that we call family. Amen. Church, you're amazing. I love you. I I think I'm going to be done in just a second. But, you know, I was thinking about, obviously, COVID has affected all of us and and a lot of us uh, in church leadership has, have been wrestling with, I mean, still going on, but for the last year now, should we meet or should we not meet? You know, and sometimes it hasn't been safe to meet. And sometimes we've been able to meet with precautions taken and safety measures taken. And I just have this stirring in my heart. I have this stirring in my heart that if the people of God do not continue to meet, and start meeting, then we miss out on this binding element that comes when we encounter the Holy Spirit together. See, we don't meet as a church because we're being reckless. We don't meet as a church because it's, to be honest, the easiest thing to do. To be, to be honest, the easiest thing to do would be to stand here and film every Saturday. We meet as a church Because we understand the power of fellowship. We understand the power of standing next to our brothers and sisters in worship as we encounter the Holy Spirit together. And he binds and knits our spirits to one another. Because that is where true unity comes from. True fellowship comes from. And that is how we, the body of Christ, the local church, become cemented together is by encountering Holy Spirit together and on our own so that when we come together, it's even more powerful. Amen. Well, I am going to invite Joaquin to come up and share. I know that he's got a word on his heart and it's a good one. So I'm excited to hear this, but we love you church. We're so proud of you. We're so proud of you. I just, I just want to like grab your faces and give you a kiss on the cheek and just be like, good job, good job. This is the church being the church. And you've done so well. And I'm so proud of you. So good. What an encouraging and right on word that is right there. And uh, I, I just echo that. We got an amazing community of people. Um, our our community, the church at large, has been doing a great job. Uh, cr- other Christian organizations, shout out to Austin Disaster Relief Network and the job they're doing, just uh, organizing relief in so many different ways. Uh, just incredible. Um, so many people have stepped up, but uh, you know, in particular, I love uh, the video of, of Chad Owens pulling the uh, the HEB semi truck out uh, stuck in ice with his with his big four wheel drive pulling out a, a semi truck. Uh, but so many people have stepped up in incredible incredible ways 
And I'm just reiterating what Renee said already, but we are so thankful for, the, for you all actually stepping up and being the church in this season. Well done. Um, I want to talk actually um, uh, uh, Psalms 91. I'm just going to, I'm going to basically share uh, Psalms 91 uh, with you and open it up just a little bit uh, more. But, it, you know, this, is, this has been a wild week. Uh, if you're watching from local, you, you totally understand um, if you're watching international, but it hasn't, uh, or, or national, you, you've seen on the news what's been going on here. But it's not just this week, you know, it's been the, it's been this, the whole year. The last 12 months have been wild. Um, you know, one thing from another and, you know, uh, the world's being shaken a little bit right now. And, you know, do you remember back to the, uh, the wildfires in Australia that were gripping the news the very beginning of 2020? It's like, that's, that's forgotten almost with so many other things have just layered on top of it. And the world's being shaken, but the good thing, the good news is for those of us who are believers, we're not of the world, and the Bible tells us that we're to not be shaken. And God makes provision for us that is beyond what the world has available to them. And we actually, we actually have not only the ability for ourselves to step into that provision that God has made, but we also have a, a responsibility, so to speak, to step in so that the world sees the light of God shining on us. The world needs to look and see people who are shrouded in peace to see people who are anchored, to see people that have a confidence, uh, unshaking, unwavering confidence and peace and resound unlike the rest of the world. The world wants hope and needs hope right now, and we are called to be carriers of this hope that people can say there is something different about what that group of people is carrying. I want that. I need to know the anchor. And we know the anchor, obviously, is Jesus Christ. But we need to be the, able to introduce people to this anchor. And there's so many great volunteer opportunities that are going to be unfolding over the next week to help in practical ways. But we want to bring water. We want to bring food. There's going to be weeks of cleanup, if not months, fixing pipes. We want to be very engaged in that. But listen, we don't want to just drop off water and leave. We don't want to just fix a pipe. We want to bring the light and the love of God as we fix a pipe. We want to bring eternal perspective like Renee was just preaching on. And I want to talk about hiding in the shadow of his wings, being hidden in God in the secret place, being unshakable in God. You know, in the Old Testament, uh, God provided the tabernacle for his people, Israel, in and, and, and really a time of, of a, a darkness and a time of trial. And they were disconnected from God. And God created a, the tabernacle as a meeting place for his people to still connect with him. But, but that season, all of those things are really a type and shadow for things to come. And that season, as glorious as, as it was, the the the... The, the kabod glory of God dwelling, the manifest glory of God dwelling on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. As glorious as that was, Paul says that that glory pales in comparison to the current glory. That that literally is just a type and shadow of what was to come and what is in Christ. And we still have access to an even greater reality to come, but we have the ability to pull that reality into the now and to display it to a hungry world. There's so much inclusive language in the gospel that we, the beauty of this relationship, of this walk is that we don't have a distant God. We don't have a disconnected Savior. We don't have a, a a stoic, unemotionally connected father. No, we have a good father, and we have a loving Savior, and we have an ever-present hope. We, we have the kingdom that is at hand. We have a God who is not just with us, but in us. It's all this inclusive language, and Paul tells us in Romans 13 to put on Christ and to make no provision for the, for the flesh. 
in Ephesians 6, it says to put on, to put on the whole armor of God. That we are called to step into the things of God. And I want, I want to just break down Psalms 91 a little bit, that we actually are, are not just hearing the words, but we're receiving the marrow from the bones and, and the nectar because we're called to be an unshakable people. And Psalms 91 is such a beautiful uh, picture of the protection of God. And and, and for, for generations, people have been running to Psalms 91 in times of trouble and shaking because it builds a confidence. There's a truth in there. But I want to make sure that we are that we are pulling out all the marrow of that truth, that we are the unshakable church. I'm just going to read it first. And I just want even the words. I'm sure most of us on here hearing this have read it before, but I want to read it over you, over your household, over your family, and over this season. And I just want the words just to sink in over you. But then I'm going to go back through and break it down just a little bit for us. Psalms 91. One who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who rescues you from the net of the trapper and from the deadly plague. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will make refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a wall. I'm reading out of the NASB. Uh Verse 5, you will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day, of the plague that stalks in the darkness or of the destruction that devastates at noon. A thousand may fall by your side, 10,000 may fall at your side, at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the retaliation against the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil will happen to you, nor will any plague come near your tent. Powerful language here. For he will give his angels order concerning you to protect you in all your ways. On their hands they will lift you up so that you do not strike your foot against a stone. You will walk upon the lion and cobra. You will trample the young lion and the serpent because he is, because, <clears throat> now there's a shift here in, vort, in verse 14 I'll talk about in a minute. Because he has loved me, now it's the Lord speaking, because he has loved me, I will save him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. I will satisfy him with a long life and show him my salvation. Amazing promises. What a good God. And again, the the reality, Renee hit it earlier, but the reality is that we have a living, ever-present God. He's not distant. He's not far off. This isn't, this isn't just a picture language. This is living hope. This is what we are supposed to step into and live in. We're supposed to see this manifested in our life. There's some beautiful, some beautiful keys in here that we, can, that we can break into and I hope pull even more uh, marrow from this amazing psalm that is, that is a rock in, in times of shaking and trouble. You know, David, who wrote the psalms, went through some shaking in his day. He went through some troubles. He went through some some highs, and he went through some lows. And out of that, David pours out his heart in the Psalms. And I tell you, when you're searching for answers, go into the Psalms and just start digging through. There is so much life to be gleaned from the Psalms. But David knows what it is to be steadfast in trouble. And he's honest in his experience and his expression that he didn't have it together in every moment. And there was times where he was wondering where God was and where this, this salvation of God, the promises of God were. But he kept digging and he kept worshiping until he would find him and he would find the promises of God. 
going back to the beginning of Psalms 91. One who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. Dwell means to sit or to remain. And shelter is a covering or a hiding place or secrecy. And, you know, this all starts, this all, let me say it this way, this all comes alive in intimacy with God. Because we can, we can read the word, and if it just remains two-dimensional information on a page or in a tablet, then we don't actually step in. We don't enter in to the fullness of the promise. Again, we have to put on the armor of God, not just talk about it. That we need to put on Christ, not just talk about it. We need to be baptized, fully submerged, not just, not just talk about it. We actually need to step into the promises that God offers, and the reality of Psalms 91 starts and ends in intimacy and relationship with God because there is a secret place and there is a hiding place that God is inviting us all to step into right now at this moment. I will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Abide means to lodge. It actually means to spend the night or to weather the night. And in the imagery of the Bible, uh, night often is in reference to when trouble comes or the enemy tries to come. But in the secret place of God, in, in his abiding is, is when we are protected through the night season. But again, it's an abiding. It's a dwelling. It's not just a moment. It's not just I open Psalms 91 and I take the three minutes that it takes to read it. And then I'm like, okay, that solves it. No, I actually have to step into the reality of the promise. We need to abide in the promise. We need to lodge there. We need to, we need to, spe- we need to check in and spend the night. <clears throat> Verse 2, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for it is he who rescues you from the net of the trapper and from the deadly plague. Verse 4, he will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you may take refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a wall. Pinions are tips of wings, of birds' wings, and the, the, the actual flight feathers that make flight possible. And wings are very interesting imagery here. And in Malachi 4.2, it tells us that he has healing in his wings. But in biblical times, that, that the, the uh, rabbis and the priests, they have a, a, prayer, a prayer shawl. Most of you have seen images of this. They have a prayer shawl uh, and that has tassels. And the hem of the prayer shawl and the tassels are referred to as the wings. That's the tallit. And it, the tassels are the wings. And the rabbis, when they go into prayer, they can be in public. But when they go into prayer, they pull that over their heads. And that's called their secret place. And it's actually, remember the tabernacle, it's type and shadow. It's actually imagery of what we're supposed to fully be living in. And that is imagery of anywhere you are, that you can be in public, you can be in the midst of chaos, you can be in a, on a busy street, but you can go into your spiritual secret place and connect with God and be hidden in his presence. And there's healing in his wings. Verse 5, you will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day, or of the plague that stalks in darkness or the destruction that devastates at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. Now listen, this, this language is because we've gone into the secret place. The verse is right before that we need to know how to abide with God, to dwell with God, to step into that place of intimacy, to get hidden in God. And it's in that hiding that that a thousand are falling on this side and 10,000 are falling on this side, but nothing is coming to touch you because you're hidden. Because you're learning how to spend the night in the secret place where nothing can touch you. Verse 8, you will look on with your eyes and see the retaliation against the wicked, for you have made the Lord my refuge, the most high, your dwelling place. Now, 
Verse 9 again, for you have made the Lord my refuge, the most high, your dwelling place. Now this word made, for you have made the Lord, is literally to put into place or to set. And again, the, the language there, the image there, is that there's a conscious, that there's a conscious approach to recognizing that the Lord is our tabernacle. That he is the spiritual reality of what the image of, of the tent of Moses represented, but he's available right now. And when we come into prayer, we have to put him before us. I set him in place, and then I step inside in intimacy, in worship, and I become shrouded with the presence of God. I become shrouded with the reality of God, where A 1,000 may fall on one side and 10,000 on the other, but he doesn't touch, but evil doesn't touch me because I'm hidden in God. Psalms 100, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Again, there's this proactive invitation from God and approach on our behalf to enter into the promise. Verse 10, no evil will happen to you, nor will any plague come near your tent. Now, no plague, no evil touching you, no plague coming to your tent. Your tent is not just your physical home, your dwelling, your apartment, wherever you live. It is that spiritual tabernacle that you've created with God. It's your ability to pull the the prayer cloth over your head and go into your tent. That, that which is the presence of God, which is where no evil can dwell, where no sickness can dwell. That is where evil won't touch you and the plague won't touch you. That tent, and if you learn, how to, and if you tabernacle with God in your house, then of course your house will become covered with that tent. Your apartment will become covered with that tent, but it's not first the physical location, it's first the spiritual reality that manifests over the physical location. For he will give his angels order concerning you to protect you in all your ways. On their hands they will lift you up so that you do not strike your foot against a stone. You will walk upon the lion and cobra. You will trample the young lion and the serpent. Because, now listen, this is, I, I mentioned it earlier. We're at verse 14 now. And this is actually a dialogue, this Psalms, that it's David pouring his heart out to the Lord, praising God, extolling him, and then God responding to David. So the actual, the, the, the voice speaks, uh, switches here. Uh, the, the voice speaking switches, and now it's God responding. And he says, because he has loved me, God speaking of David, because he has loved me, I will save him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. Because he has known my name is the word yada, the Hebrew word yada, which means knowledge through the senses. It implies intimacy. It's the same word that it says that Adam knew Eve and they bore a son, that there was an intimate exchange, that it's in this the yada of God that these promises come to fruition in knowing God in the five senses. Listen. There's a world out there who needs to see Christians who know how to yada with God, who know how to come into the secret place, who know how to get so filled up with God that they're not shaken by what's going on in the world around them. They're so lost in his presence and his goodness and in his reality that this reality doesn't distract them, doesn't deter them, doesn't get them off kilter. And the world goes, oh, there's hope available that they will reach out for. You can watch with your eyes. Earlier it says, you will watch with your eyes and you will see all these things happen, but it won't touch you. <clears throat> the, I'm catching myself up. <clears throat> because he has loved me. That this statement, because he has loved me, it, it means that there is um, an, a, to be attached to 
in love. God is saying, David, he's not just saying he loves me with his words, that he's that David has found the secret, he's found the umbilical cord. That David has pushed through all the confusion that he's that he's pushed through the outer court, he's pushed through the inner court, and he's pushed in to the holy of holies, he's pushed into intimacy intimacy with me, and he's found me. He's connected to me in love. He's found this umbilical cord, and that releases the life for all these other promises. Because he is connected to me or attached to me in love, all these things come to pass. And the, this, uh, to be set on high, literally means an inaccessible height. Literally, an inaccessible height. So when it says you will look with your eyes and you'll see all these things going going on, but it won't touch you because in the natural, we can be on the same plane. But in the spiritual, we've stepped into the, we've stepped into the holy place elevator. And we've elevated to a place that actually in the spirit, you can't be touched. And a thousand are falling on one side and 10,000 on the other, but you're not touched it's what David refers to in Psalms 27 about preparing a table for him in the presence of his enemies. God wants to lift you up out of reach. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 15, he will call upon me and I will answer him. This is, again, this is the Lord speaking of David. He will call upon me and I will answer him I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. Again, this is because he is attached to the Lord in, in love. And the yada, he's, he's come again and again to experience the love of God. Not just read about it, not just know about it, but to experience. And God says, I will rescue him and honor him powerful language. Now, remember that this, this prayer, this exchange between David and God, it started with being rescued from trouble. It, started, it starts with there's a whole lot of shaking going on. There's a whole, it starts with, I need to come and hide under your wing because the world around me is going crazy. There's thousands falling on this side and that, and I need to come hiding. But God doesn't stop just with protecting you. He says, I will rescue him and honor him. But that word honor there is the word kabod. It actually means weighty presence of God. He doesn't just mean I'm going to honor him as give him a medal or give him a pat on the back. He says, I'm going to rescue him, but I'm going to honor him, meaning I'm going to put God, saying I'm going to put my weighty nature and presence upon him. Do you, do you know why God honors his, his chosen one with his presence, because there's nothing higher. Gold is not more valuable than the presence of God. There's no position that's more honoring than having the favor of God. There's nothing that God can give as an honor that is higher or more valuable than himself. So he doesn't just rescue David. When you come into the secret place, you don't just get rescued. You don't just get protected. You get honored. You get blessed with the presence and weighty favor of God himself. No wonder why arrows can't get to you. No wonder why pestilence and plagues can't reach you. Because you're covered with him. In the last verse, I will satisfy him with a long life and show him my salvation. Satisfy. The word satisfy here actually means an excessive amount. Again, it doesn't just stop with enough. God is the God of more than enough. He's the God of abundance. That he doesn't satisfy just to the point of I'm not hungry anymore, that I, I'm just not starving. No, it's, it's, you're full and there's still a table, a buffet before you. Enough for you and for your family and for your neighbors and for the strangers. And you can start inviting people into the abundance that God provides for you and for the church. An excessive amount. I will 
satisfy him with a long life and show him my salvation. And that word salvation is the word Yeshua. Sound familiar? Again, that we are to put on Christ. It's a lower clay lowercase Yeshua, but it is salvation, literally salvation, which Jesus is our salvation. That we get to step in, we step into this secret place, we're actually stepping in to Christ. And it means salvation, it also means welfare, deliverance, and victory. God's got a secret place for you. And I want I share this because, yeah, there's some shaking going on in the world. But it's the perfect place for the church to display the unshakable nature and love and steadfast adoration in the Lord. That it doesn't matter what's going on on our left or what's going on on our right. We're so lost in the secret place. We've learned how to pull the spiritual talit over us in public, in the midst of trials, in the midst of problems, to pull it over and connect with him in love. We get elevated past all the problems. And he doesn't stop by just rescuing us, but he fills us with more than enough, an abundance, an excess that others can come and benefit from and be fed from. I just want to invite you. I, I, I feel like I'm sharing, but the Lord put on my heart because I feel like he's inviting you to step into the shadow of his wings in the tabernacling with him. He wants to fill you with his excess to satisfy you and to give you welfare and deliverance and victory in this season. I'm going to invite the team to come back up, and we've had a full service, but we're going to end right where we left off in worship. I I just love that song, and I felt like they were prophesying into this very thing. But I want to I want to invite the tabernacling of God's presence to come over your home right now. Your car, wherever you're listening from, wherever you're watching from, I want to invite the tabernacling of his presence to come over you. I want to invite the the spiritual talit. I want to invite I want to invite his wings, the shadow of his wings that have healing and deliverance and salvation in them to come over you. The door is open, but you just need to step in. Father, I thank you that you are the Prince of Peace. I thank you that you are good. I thank you that you come to give life and life more abundantly. Father, I thank you that you are calling us to be the head and not the tail. Father, I thank you that it's in times of uncertainty and times of trial and times of struggle, Father, that the church shines brightest. So, Father, I'm asking that even as we end with this song, that you would turn up that internal light, Father, of shining and confidence and unwavering trust in you. And, Father, I thank you for your kabod filling every house. Thank you for your kabod, Father, the weight of your glory and presence and favor, God. And God, I pray that our neighbors would notice. That's what I'm asking, God, that you would fill every house right now in a way that our neighbors would notice. God, that the people in the long lines at the supermarket would notice. And Father, they wouldn't have to just come to us, but we would be so satisfied, God, to overflowing that we would be filled, God, beyond capacity that we could turn to them in the line and say, hey, I have something that I know you're really hungering for. I have peace, even now. So Father, I thank you for your reality. I just ask you to do this with me, just... Pull your spiritual to lead over you. And let's step into the secret place. But I want you, I want you not just to take a moment. I want you to check in for the night and to abide with God in this place. And let him elevate us up. 
beyond the striving, beyond the struggles, beyond the conflicts, in the fullness of his goodbye.
you so much for joining us tonight, man. God is so good. He is so near. His promises are true. They are yes and amen. I encourage you to cling to Jesus tonight. Draw near. Draw near. Abide with your Savior. He's so, so good. We are praying for each one of you tonight that you would encounter the living God. Oh man, if you don't know Jesus, He is so good. He is so real. His love for you. King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords, let him in, let him in, wow, his presence is so strong in this place, and I just pray that wherever you are, I just want to pray for those all over the state of Texas right now that are the utility workers. We've got people all over our state that have been just tirelessly bringing back power and water. And so, Father, we just pray for those all over our state. God, those in Austin and all over Texas that are tirelessly serving. And God, we pray that you would just give back to them, pressed down, shaken together, running over. God, that your blessings would pour out on their households and on their families, that strength would fill them tonight. And God, I pray that the church would be the tangible hands and feet of Jesus and that we would get to love on those in our city. Thank you for joining us. We bless you tonight. Good night.